Um, let us settle into our seats, please. Let us settle into our seats and be reverent. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, we are excited uh, that we have Dr. Peter McCullough here presenting today. Um, we have about another six minutes. Heard of Dr. Peter McCullough. I actually heard of him on YouTube, okay? Somebody was talking about this doctor uh, that he had this, um, this protocol for COVID. Um, when I had COVID, I got it pretty bad. Uh, but I was watching a lot of his videos, and then all of a sudden, uh, I heard that he was uh, giving some presentations at some Adventist churches. Uh, I believe you've done a couple in Michigan? Yes, okay. Uh, so I was wondering what it would take to get him to present at this church. And lo and behold, Lance knew of him, so we finally were able to connect, and today we have him here. So right now, before we start, we are going to have a uh, quick word of prayer, and then we are going to start off by watching a video, if I'm not mistaken, and then Dr. McCullough will uh, do his presentation. So let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you once again for this opportunity that we've had today to listen to your word. Father, uh, now as we listen uh, to more instruction, uh, may it be informative and may we put uh, what we learn into action. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please bear with us with the technology as uh, we're going to do the best we can as quickly as we can. So we can go ahead and play that video first and just give us a couple of minutes. Emanating from Wuhan, China is sweeping across the globe. Something is off. The disease caused by the... So we got the audio working now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we are limited, but with you we are limitless. Father, please help us with the technology so that it may work correctly uh, and timely. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. A deadly virus God emanating from up. Wuhan, China, is sweeping across the globe. Something is off. The disease caused by the novel coronavirus has been titled COVID-19. What we're being told doesn't add up. In this crisis that we have, that people... Congress passes a multi-billion dollar bill that will bring... There is no cure and no way to treat this illness. All we can do is wait for a vaccine. All we can do, all we can do, all we can do is wait for a vaccine. There must be a doctor out there who's questioning this. I'm Dr. Peter McCullough. I'm the vice chairman of internal medicine. The only chance to reduce the risks of hospitalization is early home treatment. We can beat this pandemic. Patients actually think the virus is untreatable. There's such a focus on the vaccine. Where's the focus on people sick right now? The pressure to suppress any hope of treatment is extraordinary. Why the single-minded focus on the vaccine? What is that? What is that about? That's really gonna be the goal of investigative reporters to figure this out. Unprecedented lockdowns. Devastating economic damage, huge violations of personal freedom, families separated from their loved ones, all in the name of a medical emergency. Things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to the entire world. The hope we have of protecting our communities is to get a needle in every arm. I am not going to follow what you are suggesting and let the virus slaughter my patients. John, I'm watching what's happening. This is a treatable illness. I don't think this is a matter of academic debate and confusion. What the evidence shows is that this is an organized criminal enterprise. They call this a business opportunity. People need to know the truth. We are witnessing the greatest organized crime in history to the tune of trillions of dollars. The biopharmaceutical complex is using censorship, propaganda, and manipulation to keep people living in fear. But what we need now is courage.
Wow, thank you so much. Thanks for the audience. And thanks so much to each and every one of you for attending and the invitation. I'm Dr. Peter McCullough. I'm a practicing internist here in the Dallas area. I was uh, at Baylor for many, many years, and now my office is in uh, McKinney, Texas. And we're going to talk about together, and I will present in the next hour, what I think is modern medicine's great controversy. I think we are in a great controversy. In a way, it has a parallelism to what Ellen White wrote about 170 years ago. There is a controversy going on. Everyone in the room would acknowledge something has happened through the last several years of our lives in the world. All at once, simultaneously, something has happened. Something has happened. Things don't seem right. People feel uncomfortable, off axis. We hear the, the term loss of trust over and over again. We have an unprecedented, well-documented body of evidence suggesting widespread corruption and deception going on. Even what that book trailer showed, this idea that there could be an organized crime underway, I mean, that is being actively investigated in Washington, D.C. This week, Senator Rand Paul had people who were involved in the creation of the virus that got us sick and in the creation of the vaccines used. It's under investigation. It's not okay what happened. It's not okay that people lost their lives due to this illness. And it's certainly not acceptable that people have been damaged or disabled or lost their lives from the vaccine. Whatever is going on is going on all over the world simultaneously all at once, even in the smallest, most remote areas of the world. We are in a time of great controversy. Yep. Point. There we go. What I think is going on and this is something I have not reviewed critically prior to the pandemic. I'm an internist and a cardiologist. Like you and probably like many of your family members and doctors, I accepted vaccines uncritically. They were just part of medical practice. I counted up the number of vaccines that I personally took in the course of my life. It's 69 because they add up over time. We take a lot of vaccines. But vaccine ideology says that humans are inherently susceptible to infectious disease threats and that through medical innovation, vaccines can make the human body more resilient through immunization. But because the vaccines are not perfect, and the word perfect means not completely safe and not completely effective, for them to work on a population basis, everyone must take a vaccine. Everyone. This has gone on for about 300 years, starting with the initial nursemaids who tried uh, to inoculate cowpox and smallpox, and then Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur, and it went and went and went. It, it bubbled up to a, a furor in, in the uh, 1850 to about 1910 with the smallpox vaccine program. These are early vaccines. Smallpox vaccine was derived from taking fluid, infected fluid from a cow or a pig or a rabbit or another human, and then actually injecting it in the skin of another human. And then I can tell you, in 1875, it was impossible to purify that. 
it was impossible to make sure that that is free of contaminants. So you can imagine what happened with the smallpox vaccine. People were injected with syphilis, with tetanus, with staphylococcus. These were the dirty products. They had to be. There was no technological way to make them pure. And so people suffered at the end of the smallpox needle. The needles were reused in, among other people and hepatitis spread. It was awful. People died awful deaths after the smallpox vaccine. And yet smallpox raged on. Smallpox was an illness of lack of cleanliness of bed linens and, and hygiene. It became so bad, there was forced vaccination. Mothers were put in jail. People were put on the ground by army officers and they were vaccinated with a smallpox vaccine. Their civil rights were taken away. Kids couldn't go to school. People were marching in the streets. Finally, it was a city in England, Leicester, England, said, we're not taking the vaccine. We are not taking it. They became the control group. They did fine. Smallpox ultimately went away, largely because of improved hygiene. By the time there was a declaration that the smallpox uh, uh, problem was eradicated, only 5 to 10 percent of the world took a smallpox vaccine. So the vaccine could not have accounted for the problem going away. That is the legacy of vaccination. That's the legacy. That's, in a sense, it's, it's a... It's, it's a, it, it's a unsettling part of medical history, and from there it doesn't get much better. Next slide. Should I, should I point at the, uh, at the screen or up there? Is it on? Oh, there you go. Things work better if they're on. Okay, this is the virus. This is SARS-CoV-2 virus. Virtually everybody in this room has had this virus in their body. Virtually every. Now the red blobs on the surface, that's called the spike protein. The spike protein. It is 1,225 amino acids, 3,800 base pairs code for it. The spike protein was intentionally manipulated in the Wuhan Institute of Virology Biosecurity Lab. It was manipulated to be able to infect human beings and cause death on purpose. It's called gain-of-function research. That's what Senator Ram Paul is investigating very vigorously right now. This was occurring almost certainly in, from the years 2012 all the way forward till the time of the pandemic. It was a U.S.-Chinese collaboration. The lead in the United States is a doctor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Ralph Barrick. Dr. Anthony Fauci, his division, oversaw all this. Peter Daszak, who is at EcoHealth Alliance, still is. That's a non-governmental organization that coordinates research. He coordinated the plans from Chapel Hill over to China and Dr. Xingling Li in China. In fact, they're all on manuscripts together that declare that they've created the virus. The manuscripts were published in 2015 in Nature Medicine and 2016 in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. They said, we created it. We created this chimeric virus. It takes part of a human virus and part of a bat virus and now can actually invade and kill. Recently, I testified in the U.S. House of Representatives, so I was on Capitol Hill, and, um, and Dr. Anthony Fauci had just testified um, ahead of me. So the same committee, so we had a chance to talk. And for the first time, what finally Fauci has conceded is that the purpose of making this virus was to actually make a vaccine. That was the purpose of it. This idea of trying to get ahead of nature. Can we anticipate what nature is going to do? But as we sit here today, that spike protein is a problem. When we measure blood tests, it's still in our bodies years later. We haven't gotten rid of this. There are some infections that install themselves in the human body that it's very hard for the body to get rid of. One of them is Lyme disease. If anybody here has had Lyme disease, once that Borrelia burgdorferi, it's really hard to get out of the body. 
Another one is syphilis. Once we have syphilis, it's very hard to get out of the body. This spike protein is in us. In my office, we measure it in my office every day, and it's, it's really rare to find somebody who has no detectable evidence of spike protein. It's in our body. It's kind of unsettling. Now, the vaccines are the genetic code for the spike protein. And what we needed from the very beginning with the vaccines is a culture of safety because they were brand new. The conservative thing to do is to say, listen, we are going to watch this carefully. If there's any sign these are going to go bad, we need to be on top of it. We have to make sure that people aren't harmed by this. A culture of safety. I'm the only public figure in the world in writing who questioned the vaccines before they came out. You're looking at them. Not a single chief of medicine, no one else at any hospital here in Dallas, no one at Harvard, no one at Duke, no one at Erasmus, nobody in Stockholm. Why? Why am I the only person in writing who simply said, listen, this could be a gamble. This is a gamble here. Why? Why? Because the vaccines as proposed, Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen, and AstraZeneca, they're the genetic code for the lethal part of the virus that was developed in the Chinese biosecurity lab. The genetic code for the thing that kills is going to be put in human bodies. How are we going to shut it off? How do we control how much is made in each person? We know each person is different. Some people almost certainly are going to produce too much of the spike protein and die. It was the riskiest proposition I've ever heard of. In the first year of the pandemic, uh, uh, by invitation, I was asked to write op-eds in the Hill. Dr. Scott Atlas was uh, also, Scott and I were the two. He was writing about masking and lockdowns and, and contagion control measures, and I was on how to treat the virus, and I, I questioned the vaccines. Now, former President Trump asked Scott Atlas to go in the White House and advise him, and according to Scott's book, they spent nine months talking about masks, social distancing, lockdowns, and schools. In Scott's book, there's not a single mention of treating the problem or the vaccines. If I would have been chosen and in the White House, I would have gone, it would have been a very different pandemic, a completely different pandemic. One person could have changed the course of history. We are one person away from changing the course in history. Dr. Uh, Estevito White House in Mexico has done great work and published uh, a whole series of papers on this now. Pfizer and Moderna, so in the United States, we have about 75% of Americans who took a vaccine, who really took a COVID vaccine, according to the COVID States program, it's a Harvard population-based survey. The CDC is overestimating how many people really took the shot, but it's 75%. Of the 75% who took the shot, 94% took Pfizer and Moderna. Fewer took uh, Janssen or Johnson & Johnson, and that was an adenoviral vector vaccine, and most people don't even know about the Novavax vaccine, which is still on the market. Why did people take Pfizer or Moderna preferentially over anything else? The answer, because Pfizer Moderna's marketing firm, Weber Shandwick, has an installed marketing unit in the CDC, and the CDC is actually paying them to be marketed and push Pfizer and Moderna. Rand Paul sent a letter to the CDC and said, listen, you can't have a marketing firm pushing one set of brands of vaccines. Why? Novavax doesn't have any genetics in it. I, that would, me, that would be vastly preferable. Novavax is like a tetanus shot. It, it invariably would be safer, but yet it, it, it never it was even mentioned in any of the promotional materials. It never even was a thought. I've barely seen any patients who took Novavax. But as White House points out, the genetic code is installed in the human body. 
and now our cells are harnessed to produce this spike protein. With um, Acevedo White House, myself, 57 authors, we published this paper in the spring of 2021, and we sent it to every single government in the world that was undertaking vaccination, and we said, we have great concerns about what's going on. Where will this vaccine go in the human body? How can we possibly shut it off? Where are the data to show it could be safe in a young woman who would want to conceive and have a baby, or in a young man who would want to be a father? Why are all of the regulatory standards being thrown out the window? During the randomized trials, a pregnant woman couldn't even take these vaccines. Someone who had previously had COVID couldn't take a vaccine. They were not eligible to receive the vaccine. And yet, when they were introduced on December 10th, 2020, our government said, here, anybody take the vaccine. Anybody, just go ahead and everybody take it. Wait a minute. If you've already had it, the only purpose to take a vaccine is to prevent you from getting the first case of the illness. If you've already had it, you wouldn't just take more vaccines. There was early paper showing that's going to be trouble. Pregnant women are always excluded from novel treatments because we don't know. There's two patients. There's the mother and the baby. We had early data showing pregnant women had better outcomes than non-pregnant women because pregnancy is a natural, robust state of an immunity. It's not an immunocompromised state. It's a very strong state. And yet, in the first week of the program, 3,000 pregnant women took the vaccine. I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified. How could we just throw everything we know about safety out the window? Here's one analysis on just women who took the vaccine who are breastfeeding and all of the reports of things happening in babies, babies having hemorrhage, birth defects. This is a lot of reports. That is hundreds and hundreds of reports. This is reported into our system. A paper from Stanford showed that the messenger RNA is stuck in the lymph nodes in women around the breast for 60 days, and that's as long as they've looked. We've never had a vaccine stay in lymph nodes for months. Never. Ever. This paper... Um, uh, demonstrated that the messenger RNA is circulating in the bloodstream for a month. It's physically in the bloodstream, and that's as long as they've looked. One paper from Malmo, Sweden, Marcus Alden, demonstrated that at least the center part of the genetic code for Pfizer is rapidly taken up into the human nucleus. Now, this is a human hepatoma cell line, so it's, a, it's not normal somatic cells, but this does get into the human genome as demonstrated by this paper, at least that center portion. Now, Yang Di Marinis is the senior author, and she's very credible. The belief is if the center part of the code gets in the human nucleus and into the genome, the whole thing. This paper has never been disputed. As we sit here today, it's very likely that people who took Pfizer and Moderna have the genetic code permanently installed, at least in some cells in the body, in a mosaic of cells. That's forever. If it's part of the human genetic code, that's forever. Now, hopefully, the human body can have some repair and edit this out. But they're very confident that the reporter region, that 444 base pair, that that's legit. On the CDC website, they said, oh, this won't change your DNA. This won't. It does. Hannah and colleagues have demonstrated the vaccines get into breast milk and they get into the placenta and into the blood that goes to the baby. That's our biggest nightmare of what could possibly happen. Pfizer was told they must do a study on pregnant women, a prospective randomized trial, and they did it. They cut the trial short, and they would not release the results for years. Finally, under court order, the results were released. The women who took the Pfizer vaccine compared to the placebo had four times the rate of birth defects in babies. 
it's turning out to be a nightmare. Four labs and two papers now show that Pfizer and Moderna are contaminated with DNA process-related impurities. So it's not just messenger RNA. There's little bits of DNA. It's called SV40 promoter enhancer and the origin of insertion. These are technical terms to show that DNA is used to make the RNA in E. coli and they're not, pure, they're not filtered out enough and some people are getting fragments of DNA. SV40 stands for simian virus 40. It's a known proto-oncogene activator. This is a cancer-promoting substance and it's happened before. I told you the smallpox vaccines were contaminated. They were contaminated with bacteria but the polio vaccine was contaminated with SV40, so the same technology was used. And between 1959 and 1963, 98 million Americans received the polio vaccine contaminated with the, the carcinogenic monkey virus, SV40. And that's, that's published in the National Academy of Sciences. I'm one of them. I received. My mom didn't know. I didn't know. My mom's doctor didn't know. The vaccines have a legacy to them. And doctors want to forget this. They want to wash this out of their... We just want to stay safe and effective. They don't want to talk about this. But we have to talk about it. This is a reality. What do we know? We have a safety system of reporting in the United States, which per year, there are under 200 deaths per year with vaccines, the flu shots, the pneumococcal vaccines, the childhood vaccines, and about half of America takes vaccines, half. Most, any of you are doctors and nurses, you have to take vaccines to be on staff and teachers and students. But look at what happened in 2021. This is, this is April of 2021, the number of serious side effects reported into the system and the deaths skyrocketed, skyrocketed. This was April of 2021. This is the loudest safety signal that something wrong is going on with consumer products in the history of this nation. And none of our federal agencies commented on it. There was no comment from the White House. And this was going on. Fast forward February 23, 2024. This is the vaccine adverse event reporting system. As we sit here today, the CDC is confirming 18,655 vaccine deaths. 1150 occur on the same day they take the shot. 1225 day die and the next day they take the shot. As a doctor, I report to the system only the deaths I think that have occurred due to the shot. If I falsely report something to the system, I'm subject to federal fines or imprisonment. Every single thing in this, these red boxes are real, and the doctors and nurses reporting it believe the vaccine is the cause of death. 18,655 CDC confirmed deaths. The CDC waits for the death certificate to make sure the patient died. 1150 on the same day. Can you imagine if there were cars sold at a new car dealer? And there were a thousand cars that just blew up spontaneously and the company was still allowed to sell them. It wouldn't matter how fast that car is. wouldn't matter how good that car is. It'd be pulled off the market. Five, 10, 15, no more than 50 deaths. It's gone. I don't care how good it is. Gone. We could never have an innocent American life lost by walking into a vaccine center. And yet it happened. It happened here in Dallas. It happened all over the world. On my radio show, I had a paramedic, Harry Fisher, he's probably the most censored person on Twitter right now, uh, tell me what happened when he got called to do CPR in the vaccine center. And these vaccine centers, remember they were in Fair Park and they were uh, here in Dallas. Uh, he was going to a vaccine center. Someone had had a cardiac arrest after taking the shot. And he recalls doing CPR and looking over his left shoulder and seeing a line that went, you know, 400 yards no one was getting out of line. People were in a fear-driven trance. They were driven by fear. They were, they were told, 
All they could do is take a vaccine. They were told there's no treatment for this illness. All you can do is take a vaccine. What's the real number? This VAR system, if we don't have the vaccine card and we don't have all the information, I can't report. I can't legitimately report. The, in the FDA uh, deliberations on this, the underreporting factor is conservatively 30. So as we sit here today, there are over 550,000 Americans who have died after the vaccine. This is worse than the Civil War. Now with COVID, there's been about 1.2 million deaths with COVID, liberally uh, coded in hospitals. The CDC says 10% of that is really due to the virus and not other medical problems. So it's probably about a, legitimately 120,000 deaths. And those who died of COVID, it's because they didn't receive early treatment on day one. They were denied treatment. So the vaccines have caused more death than the problem they were designed to handle. Now, fortunately, at least 32% of people who took a shot have had zero side effects, nothing. This is very good data from Denmark, nothing, not even a sore arm. 63.7% of people have had some modest side effects, nothing big, and it's 4.2% that have had a real problem, serious problem. In our CDC vSafe data, the number 7.7% .7 of Americans have really had a problem. So fortunately, the majority of people are fine. The majority of people are fine. But it, even when we go back, I ask people, people ask me all the time, Dr. McCullough, am I going to have a problem? I said, do you have a sore arm to begin with? It, it starts with originally what one felt when they had the, the vaccine. What explains the variability? Some of the vials may have far more messenger RNA in them. There's the uh, DNA process-related impurities. The vaccines have visible contaminants in them. The Japanese have returned millions of doses, for sure. Not a single government in the world has done an inspection of what is in the vials. They haven't taken off the cap and independently inspected how much vaccine is in there, how much contaminants, despite Senator Ron Johnson directly asking our CDC and FDA to inspect the vials. Surgeon General Joe Ladapo in Florida said, listen, inspect the vials. What is in these vials? Dr. Uh, Verbicki Manichi in, in Copenhagen, who I had a chance to meet, they did the same thing in Denmark. Not a single country in the world will open up the vials of the vaccine and analyze what's in it and why some people are getting very sick and dying and why other people aren't. We should all be greatly concerned with the lack of inspection of these vaccines. They've been now out on the U.S. market for three years. We can inspect things very rapidly. There's been a denial of every country in the world to examine what is in the vials. What we've learned since the vaccines have come out has been horrifying. Um, there are um, cardiovascular, neurologic, hematologic, and immunologic side effects that are well characterized. In fact, agencies have put out warnings. The vaccines cause heart damage, cause myocarditis. Warning, the vaccines cause blood clots that can be fatal. These are official warnings, but yet people have still been told they should take them. They have to take them for their job. In fact, the FDA came out and said the vaccines cause heart damage in June of 2021. The NFL and the athletic leagues mandated the vaccines in August of 2021, knowing that the FDA says they cause heart damage, particularly in athletes who have a big surge of adrenaline. And so it's not like people didn't know. People knew. The appropriate thing for the NFL to do and the college teams would say, listen, this warning is serious. We, we can't have our athletes suffer heart damage. We're going to decline the vaccines. That would have been the appropriate thing. There's a warning, and then one can, can fairly decline. Not put out a warning and then mandate it. A fifth area of concern is cancer. Now, this paper is from, published from University of Oregon. 
suggesting that because they are genetic products, at least Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen, that there's a cancer risk through mechanisms. We don't know. When I testified in Capitol Hill, one of the questions that I had, and believe me, I took questions for hours from the committee. I told the committee, I said, you know, I've cited manuscript after manuscript, evidence base after evidence base. I have 70 peer-reviewed manuscripts myself on this topic. I said, you just had Anthony Fauci here in the same seat two days earlier. I bet he didn't cite a single piece of evidence. And they said, you're right, Dr. McCullough. Anthony Fauci couldn't cite a single source of evidence. Every single cancer registry in the world right now is skyrocketing. Every one. Reactivation of dormant cancers, new cancers, cancers at a very early age that progress very rapidly. They've been so rapid, they're termed turbo cancers. Every all-cause mortality registry in the United States is skyrocketing. There are record life insurance claims of all the life insurance companies that insure people in life insurance programs. The REACT-19 group is keeping track of this. There's 3,400 peer-reviewed manuscripts describing vaccine injuries and disabilities and deaths now. This is a nightmare. And there's heavy bias against any of these publications, any of these papers being published. Most academic institutions would not sign off on a paper demonstrating a problem with the vaccines, let alone having them get published. The editor, I've submitted papers where the editor, editors say, we refuse to handle this manuscript move on somewhere else. I've published manuscripts and they've gotten so much attention that the publisher says, we're gonna retract them. I'll say, well, what's the reason? There is no reason, we're just taking it down. This 3,400 peer-reviewed manuscripts, which, which is horrifying what it's describing, is the tip of the iceberg. It's probably 340,000 manuscripts. This paper from Harvard that did make it through shows the vaccine is in the human heart. The messenger RNA, as shown in the human heart here on the left, is causing inflammation due to the spike protein. All that white change in the heart muscle is abnormal compared to a normal heart muscle on the right there. Pfizer and Moderna, for sure, are in the human heart after someone takes a vaccine. It's now, it's now proven. Bowmeyer and colleagues from Germany find the spike protein. They stain for the spike protein. These are in living young boys who are hospitalized with myocarditis. So we know the myocarditis is due to the vaccine. Schreckenberg has demonstrated that the vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, directly damage the heart muscle cells within about a day or so if we actually study them in an in vitro toxicity study. If these studies would have been done ahead of time, they never would have been released on the market because the conclusion would be that they damage the heart. Naka and ha Nakahara and colleagues, and this is with UT Houston School of Medicine, has published this paper. 100% of people who take the vaccine, the cardiac positron emission tomography studies turn abnormal, at least for six months. And they take on a diseased pattern. The heart normally takes up free fatty acids as its fuel. There's a shift for preferring what's called 18-fluorodeoxyglucose, or Sugar. We don't know what it means, but it's markedly abnormal. I've never seen this in my career. Never, never, never. Not a 100% relationship. Those who have a sore arm have even more abnormal uptake of 18-FGG. Yonker and colleagues, again from Harvard, with uh, young boys hospitalized with vaccine heart damage, demonstrated that the, the, the boys suffering heart damage they have the spike protein circulating in the body, but the antibodies are not neutralizing it. And the boys who are unharmed, they have spike protein, but the antibodies are appropriately neutralizing it. So this explains why some are sustaining heart damage and others are not. It probably has to do with the library of response. With myocarditis, 90% are in young boys, 10% are in women. So it is a male problem. I've published with uh, two co-authors. You can see the number of myocarditis cases that was in the peer-reviewed literature prior to the COVID vaccines. It was very rare. COVID-19 vaccines, we've had an explosion. 
and then you can see the mortality rate in the published studies is around two to five percent. So when our CDC came out and said, oh, myocarditis is mild, it's rare, and it's self-limited, no, it's not. People are dying of this. In all the published studies, young people are dying of myocarditis. Here's a case example, Choi and colleagues, a 22-year-old Korean man takes Pfizer and develops chest pain five days after the first dose. He's hospitalized and he dies in the hospital seven hours later. Do you know what it takes to kill a 22-year-old man? Histopathology. This case alone should have shut down the worldwide program. We can't have somebody take a vaccine who's perfectly healthy at age 22 and have his heart destroyed a few days later and die in the hospital. Two teenage boys in Connecticut found dead in bed on days three and four after the second dose of Pfizer. The coroner doesn't, doesn't know what to do. This is unbelievable. So he calls in the, the, um, the pathology department from University of Michigan and University of Minnesota. Conclusion, it's fatal Pfizer vaccine myocarditis. These kids didn't even get a chance for CPR. The parents are horrified. Can you imagine losing your child to a vaccine like this in their sleep? Well, it's happened to a Democratic congressman in Illinois, Sean Keston. He was pushing the vaccine on social media in 2021. He said he's going to take his kids to get vaccinated as soon as it gets approved. He took his daughter, Emily, to get vaccinated, and he found Emily dead in bed. I've had similar death in my family. It's real. When there's heart inflammation, a surge of adrenaline triggers the cardiac arrest. We get surges of adrenaline when we exercise and also between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. during the normal waking process. That's the reason why people are dying in their sleep now. Fabian Trump, she knew better. She's an Olympic uh, marathon runner from Switzerland. She took three shots. She got myocarditis. She goes, I'm not running. I'm not going to risk this cardiac arrest. She made the right, not return to, right, to running, but she's alive. Oscar Cabrera Adamas did not make the right decision. Now, he didn't want the vaccine, to be fair. He's a Dominican basketball player. He plays in a Spanish league. He said, I don't want to take the vaccine. I already had COVID. The team said, you have to take one anyway. So he takes the vaccine. He has a cardiac arrest while playing in Spain. They do CPR and they shock him on the court. He survives. And he tweets out, I got myocarditis and a cardiac arrest from the vaccine. And then two years later, he's trying to return to basketball. He's on a medical stress test and he dies on the treadmill test. Now that's several years after taking the vaccines. Now, I've supervised hundreds, if not thousands, of stress tests in my career. I've never had a patient die in the treadmill. We've had arrhythmias, we've had cardiac arrest, but we can always shock the patient back because we're right there. This must be a vicious form of a vaccine cardiac arrest to take somebody's life several years after taking the shot. In this paper, Hosher and myself published, this is in the European Society of Cardiology. This is in one of the best cardiology journals. The mechanism, what happens, the vaccines are taken up. There probably are susceptibility factors. About half the people feel myocarditis, chest pain, or other symptoms. We get an MRI, we can diagnose it, we can get on appropriate therapy, but half the people have no symptoms. And then the abnormal heart rhythm occurs, and when it does, Sometimes we can save the patient, sometimes we can't. It depends if there's a defibrillator. Is there a doctor around? You've probably seen these, these reels on, on, on the media where people are passing out and, and falling, athletes falling all over. It's real. So without protection from the pharmaceutical laws, the vaccines are going to do more harm. People have written and called and had... Senate testimony and congressional testimony all over the world and not a single country, their Health and Human Services or their FDA equivalent regulatory agencies will show any concern at all, none, no concern. Pfizer and Moderna and the other companies had an obligation to release the data 
for what happened in the first 90 days of their vaccine. Pfizer refused to release the data. The FDA, the lawyer stepped in and said they don't want Pfizer to release the data. Finally, under a court order, a year and a half later, Pfizer releases the data. Pfizer was notified of 1,223 deaths within 90 days of their vaccine. Pfizer didn't say a word in January of 2020. Neither did the FDA. They had an obligation to shut this down. Probably should have been shut down first week or so of January. Say, listen, it's not working out. Remember when the vaccines were deliberated upon in, in December 10th, 2020. We only had the first month where the two shots were given, and then we had two months of observation. And they were single-use vials made through a process where there was no E. coli, there was no contaminants, it was naked uh, messenger RNA made. And then when it was released in the public, there was a brand new process making the vaccines from E. coli. And six people could get a shot from a single vial. So there are multiple needles going in the vial. So the people who receive the vaccines in the real program are very different from the clinical trials. Even though in the clinical trials there were more deaths with Pfizer than placebo, if the committee would have fairly reviewed that, the vaccines should never be approved. But 1,223 deaths, and Pfizer doesn't say a word, and the FDA doesn't say a word? That's prima facie evidence. We've got a consumer product safety problem of major proportions on our hands right now. We've got a, we got a five alarm fire going right now, right in front of us. Now, most people kind of know. They figured out, mm, I'm not gonna take any more. I must have dodged a bullet, but some people don't. Some people don't know what can happen. They don't know. You know. Family members called in Pfizer frantically. My mother took the vaccine and they've died. Now Moderna just was finally forced under court order basically about a year and a half later. There's 17,000 Moderna deaths, but it's over a much longer period of time. This is a massive number of deaths that occur after use of a product. The World Council for Health in June 11, 2022, which is a worldwide body, I'm a member of this, said, they're not safe, pull the vaccines off the market. So if you need something to show your school or your church, it's not your opinion, it's not just my opinion, these are worldwide evidence-based bodies that have said the vaccines are not safe for human use. In the United States, the Association for uh, American Physicians and Surgeons has concluded they're not safe for human use. So if, if the AMA says to give it, and the American College of Physicians says to give it, but this group says not, so we've got a dispute, that's fine. If the vaccines were safe and effective, I wouldn't be here. I don't have any grudge against vaccines. I've taken a ton of vaccines. I would have told my patients that they're safe. I never did because they weren't. Now we've got a situation where the vast majority of doctors told the patients they were safe and they should take vaccines. To make matters worse, some doctors pushed the vaccines on the patient and said, listen, if you don't take a vaccine, I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to deliver your baby. In Italy, they told patients, you don't take a vaccine, you can't even go in the hospital get hospital care. It was in the minds of people to push these vaccines on other people because of vaccine ideology. And there was a complete lack of concern if anyone would be harmed by these vaccines. U.S. Senate, December 2022, I said pull them off the market. European Parliament, September 2023, recently in the U.S. House, Pull them off the market. They've heard the words. It's in the congressional records. It's in the National Archives. Every day these vaccines are on the market and people take more of them, there is a clock running. There are lives being lost. And someone somewhere at some time will be held accountable for this. People can't say they didn't know. What did the vaccines ever do? There were three claims made, and th they were false claims. First was the vaccines prevent infection. Well, the current, st the, the current vaccines that are on the market, 
they were only tested on animals. They weren't even tested on humans. You take the shot you were going to take right now at CVS or Walgreens has never been tested on a human being prior to approval. That's how bad this has gotten. They never stopped transmission. Our CDC director said, wait a minute, we're, we're having vaccinated people get COVID and spread it to each other, so it didn't stop transmission. They admit that. And they never reduced hospitalization and death. There's not a single randomized trial that showed that. Yet people say, well, take it to protect your grandmother. Wait a minute, the CDC had you correctly admit it doesn't stop transmission. You take a vaccine, you can give it to your grandmother. People say, well, take it because it makes it milder. No, it doesn't. There's not a single valid study that says that. Have we ever had that before? Yes, the smallpox vaccine was oversold that it was going to save people from smallpox. It didn't stop smallpox. It didn't make it less severe. People were writing articles in major medical journals saying, listen, this is not working out, just like we are now. Everything that's happened with the smallpox vaccine, we're seeing with the COVID vaccine. Fung and colleagues published this paper saying, listen, how can doctors get it wrong? There are probably, uh, you know, uh, over 100,000 papers that conclude the vaccines are safe and effective. How can that be? Because there have been milder mutations as more people are vaccinated over time. The vaccines didn't make it mild. The virus became mild. The hospital medical records default was to consider everybody unvaccinated. So they falsely assumed people in the hospital unvaccinated. They had differential testing in the hospital. The, the, the uh, unvaccinated had far more testing. There was no linkage to CDC data, so we didn't really know who took the vaccines, no control for early treatment and natural immunity. Early treatment clearly was preventing hospitalizations and deaths, and then once you had the infection, it was milder on the second and third infections. So early treatment and natural immunity reduced hospitalization and death not the vaccine. There was never any adjudication for why people were in the hospital to begin with. We know that the tests stay positive for months. And then lastly, the conflict of interest. You know, universities and medical schools, they were mandating these vaccines. Of course they're gonna publish papers declaring the vaccines are safe and effective. They received money to give these vaccines. Recently, Norman Fenton from the UK and others have identified multiple miscategorization, sources of bias in these studies. You know, declaring somebody unvaccinated when, in fact, they've taken the vaccine. What does the consent form say? This is important. The consent form in the benefits section of the consent form, which is the shortest part of the consent form, says there's only one benefit, that in the past they've been shown to reduce the infection. No claim that they make it less severe. No claim that they reduce hospitalization and death. Listen, if the vaccines were good and they did these good things, they would be in the consent form. Believe me, the consent form is written by the, the vaccine companies and approved by the U.S. FDA. The U.S. FDA is pushing these vaccines hard. In fact, the commissioner of the FDA says, well, the vaccines prevent long COVID and the vaccines reduce hospitalization and death. Well, how come they're not in the benefits section, because they don't. For the first time in medical history, our US FDA and CDC are making false claims, pushing products that, where, where they actually don't do these things. Once we got to the Omicron pandemic, the Omicron uh, subvariant broke through natural immunity. We were doing great before that. You got COVID once and you were done. The vaccines almost certainly caused this extension of the, of the pandemic. The very first people who had this dramatically different mutation were fully vaccinated. Two Japanese studies conclude the extension of the pandemic is because broad populations were vaccinated. We should never vaccinate during a pandemic because the virus is gonna mutate and figure out how to get around the vaccine. It's the worst idea in the world to broadly vaccinate through a pandemic. If we had a safe and effective vaccine, and I was leading a vaccine development program at the time uh, when I was uh, here downtown Dallas, I had laid out for the FDA that nursing home patients and workers, that was going to be the limit that we'd vaccinate in the United States, 2.7 million people. But instead, the FDA said, everybody take it. Take it down to little babies age six months old. 
Little babies didn't have a stake in this. Kids essentially got through this in the first couple of years of the pandemic. There was no need at all for young people to take the vaccine. In fact, we didn't even treat people for COVID who were young because it was like a cold. It was predictable that older senior citizens, more frail, would get sicker. But yet those who were advancing the vaccine said, everybody's going to take it. Babies will take it. And then we learned quickly, the vaccines don't work. They wear off, so now we have to take boosters. People say, well, okay, one booster, but now two boosters, now three boosters, four boosters. If we're following the current U.S. government and worldwide guidelines, someone like me would be on their ninth shot. Someone with immunocompromised would be on their 12th shot. What vaccine do we take nine shots for where, where there's no end in sight? Do you know early on in the pandemic it was released, you know, Australia had bought 14 doses per person, the whole country. How did they know so early on that it wasn't going to work and you're going to take it every six months? The Spanish flu, which is a horrible pandemic, 1918 to 1920, two years and it was done. And it's largely because we didn't have antibiotics that we had the fatalities. People don't die of influenza, they die of secondary staphylococcal pneumonia. That's what people died of. It's interesting that Woodrow Wilson was the president at the time. There's not a single recorded statement that he even made about the pandemic. That was a problem that patients and doctors and nurses dealt with. It wasn't his problem as president. Yet the pandemic turned the White House upside down. There was whole pandemic response, the government, you know, it was kind of a disaster for the Trump administration in the last year of his administration, and it's been a three-year disaster for Biden. Where we have fair information about who really took the vaccine and who didn't, like we do in the UK, it's obvious the vaccines don't work. The vast majority of people in the hospital and getting sick and sadly dying through uh, 2022 were fully vaccinated. There's been unprecedented amounts of money that have changed hands, billions of dollars. U.S., our annual budget in the United States before COVID was about $4 trillion. With COVID, it just went up to $6 trillion, and money started flowing to agencies and all over the place, and pandemic relief, whatever. And the, the pandemic was largely over with once we got through that big bulge in January of 2021. The budget, the most recent budget, didn't go down at all. It still just, it just went up and stayed up. Billions of dollars of pre-purchased products went to companies, like the vaccine companies, but also the mask companies and the uh, personal protective equipment companies. So we've always needed to have early treatment. Whether or not someone took a vaccine, we should never have assumed they were gonna work because they didn't and people could get sick. They needed treatment. The two papers that were published out of here, out of Dallas, still the most widely cited papers in the whole pandemic, were the methods by which we can treat patients. Every single one of your doctors should have quickly become an expert on how to treat COVID. They should have sent out a newsletter to you saying, listen, if you get sick, just call me. I know what to do. I bet you didn't get any newsletters. Quickly, doctors became unavailable. We had guidelines that came out. In October of 2020, by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, it said, don't treat a single patient at home. Don't do it. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Let them get sick enough to come in the hospital and still don't treat them until they need oxygen. Then you can start the very first milligram of treatment. There's never been a form of pneumonia that we wait till people need oxygen to start treatment. You must have known that's not right. You must have known that goes against the fundamental principles of medicine. Treat early in an infection, knock it out before it becomes overwhelming. But yet that happened. I said, listen, early on, this is a mass casualty event. Doctors are not, they're kind of running for the hills right now. I'm not going to let this happen on my watch. I said, listen, there are drugs out there that have signals of benefit. We're going to use all the available evidence. As long as there's acceptable safety, we'll put drugs in a combination and we'll find a way to get people through the illness. And we did. And we published to the best extent possible. It wasn't dependent on a single drug. 
It was dependent on doctors and nurses making an effort to do something. So in the United States, we focused on prescription drugs. Well, in Asia, some parts of Asia, they focused exclusively on uh, arom aromatic um, uh, uh, oils and substances and poultices, and they did something very different. And in South America, they did something different. South Africa, it didn't matter. No single drug was necessary nor sufficient. But drugs had to be used in combination in high-risk people. Otherwise, when panic set in, and people do go to the hospital, that's when the horror started. If someone went to the hospital, they immediately lost their rights. Their family members couldn't see them. Once they went on the mechanical ventilator, in many times that was curtains. Early studies showed 90% of people who went on ventilators died. A recent study from Johns Hopkins, even now when someone goes on the ventilator, mortality rate's still 40%. 40% dies? Virtually every death in America happened in the hospital. It's interesting that no one died at home or out in the streets. It's interesting that the homeless population got through COVID really easily. You didn't see homeless people dying in the streets. <laughs> hospital care contributed to death because hospital care withdrew things that we could have used as an outpatient. What did we do? We said, listen, at the time it was a long illness. There are major phases of the illness and we use categories of drugs antivirals, anti-inflammatories, and corticosteroids, and, and blood thinners. And in my book, Courage to Face COVID-19, I brought one I, I'm going to give out, I think, to whoever has the best question. But in here, uh, there's a chapter because my dad was one of the first um, uh, COVID patients in a nursing home in Dallas. And it was at Presbyterian Village. And he's, he's, he has dementia. He's flat on his back. He has a pelvic fracture. I mean, he was going to be a goner goner. There's like zero chance to survive that, right? And I had to basically look at this and say, am I going to follow Anthony Fauci and the U.S. government guidelines and give no treatment to my dad and let him die of this virus alone? Or am I going to use the best of my ability? The question on the table is why did not every doctor and nurse in this country act in the best of their ability for every patient. Why? Why did that happen? Former President Trump got sick in April of 2020 with COVID. Now he's in pretty good shape for his age. He had a doctor who came in and said, I know what to do. I'm going to do, honestly, he basically did the McCullough protocol at an early formulation of it. The president had gotten hydroxychloroquine ahead of time. He got monoclonal antibodies, corticosteroids. He got the drugs in combination, and he got through it. Why didn't President Trump and Mark Meadows and Scott Atlas, why didn't they say, listen, our president in his 70s got through this illness. I want every American to get the quality of care that President Trump get to get through this illness. What happened? How could our community let this happen to our seniors? The vast majority of people died were seniors. They were desperate. They died alone. And they were grossly undertreated. Grossly undertreated. We learned in the end the monoclonal antibodies that Trump got, I used them extensively. They were like miracle drugs. Every single person who landed in the ER should have gotten monoclonal antibodies. They didn't. Every single person should have gotten full-dose aspirin. They should have gotten nutraceuticals and supplements. Every single person, we learned later on, should have gotten ivermectin. There was a study in Florida showing 50% reductions in mortality of hospitalized patients. Recently, under a court battle, the FDA had to retract all its false statements in ivermectin. Yet every hospital in Dallas here denied people monoclonal antibodies. They denied them hydroxychloroquine. They denied them um, uh, ivermectin. They denied them nasal sprays and gargles. They denied them uh, uh, aspirin. They denied them full anticoagulation. There's a chapter in the book about a poor patient in um, College Station, Texas, in her 70s. She's a perfectly healthy 70 mother, uh, 70, 70 year old um, mother, grandmother. And the family knows that this works, that we need to use lots of drugs in the hospital. And they saw the mothers getting virtually nothing on the ventilator. 
And the family takes the hospital to court and says, please listen to other doctors and let's broaden the treatment approach. Down to a, at least a full dose of aspirin, full doses of heparin anticoagulation because she's pretty late stage, full doses of steroids. The hospital gets the best outside lawyers and spends a lot of money and they said, no, we're not doing any of that. The hospital wanted to deny her treatment, and they did in a court of law. She dies a few days later, the family gets an autopsy, and the lungs are full of blood clots, which happens at the end. Why would the hospital want to go to court to not fully give blood thinners to this patient? It was, it is, we have it all written up. We interviewed the daughter. It's all in the court records. It was in the minds of people in the pandemic to hurt other people. Why? How did that happen? It happened all over the world. One of the things I want to have you prepared for is that the World Health Organization, the um, Center for Disease Control, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness that the World Economic Forum, the Gates Foundation formed, they all say there's going to be another pandemic. It's going to be 20 times more lethal than COVID. Disease X, it's called. Making a new virus that's going to be even worse than COVID. It's all over the place. You, this is so telegraphed. One of the things you can do is learn from this clinical trial. These doctors are in Bangladesh. They don't have much, but they have sick COVID patients, and they use simply iodine. Iodine uh, uh, nasal uh, washes and iodine uh, gargles and eye drops. We're talking a couple drops of iodine in salt water, spray it up the nose, sniff it back, spit it out, put some iodine in scopolysterine, gargle for 30 seconds, do it four times a day. Look at this. It dropped the PCR positivity by day three dramatically. Using virucidal nasal sprays and washes, pretty much iodine and xylitol, this actually would have ended the pandemic or certainly would have ended spread. Something so simple as this. Look at reductions in hospital. This is a prospective randomized controlled trial. You can't get any better data than this. Dropping risk of hospitalization and need for oxygen. Nancy Mace, Republican congressman, went absolutely nuts in 2021. She said, why is our federal agencies not telling us about Simple nasal sprays and gargles, 20 studies, 53% lower risk of the outcomes in 17 randomized trials. In our book, we have a chapter. We asked one of the CEOs of the company that makes a nasal spray, how come you guys didn't get after it? Answer, the Federal Trade Commission and the FDA sued every single company making a nasal spray and tied them up, did not let nasal sprays get out to Americans. It was total. There was a complete and total suppression of early treatment to favor one strategy. That's what I told Tucker Carlson. There was one strategy and that everybody was going to take a vaccine. How do you prevent getting COVID or the flu or anything else? Here's xylitol. It comes, the brand name is called Clear, X-L-E-A-R. It's a nasal spray. This is a prospective, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. Let me go back for a second. 71% lower rate of getting the infection. This is better than a vaccine. This is better than taking hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. Everybody should be armed with one of these. If you're at risk, there's flu out there where there's even a scare on bird flu. Why not use a nasal spray and gargle? You're traveling on planes? For sure. Why did I do what I did? Was it illegal that I used ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or colchicine or aspirin? Of course not. The FDA says that when doctors are confronted with an unmet need, we should use everything available to us. I did. Where were my colleagues? I'll never forget one time, we were in March in 2020, people were getting really sick, and I was on a conference call with a bunch of doctors. I said, listen, we better get out here and start treating these patients. The hospital's too late. The, the line went dead. There wasn't a single doctor with me. This whole pandemic was about courage. Courage. That's the reason why the book has courage in the top. Courage. Who had guts to actually take some action here? 
It wasn't about wearing masks and it wasn't playing defense. Let's get on offense and help people. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's the ability to overcome it. And what I've realized is very rare. Doctors and nurses were scared stiff. Do you know that most of our conference calls was all about how are the doctors and nurses going to protect themselves with masks? And, and I, I testified in Health and Human Services in, in Austin. And every single report was, well, we're, we're protecting ourselves better with masks. We're doing better with hand sanitizer. We're doing, I said, isn't it, isn't it going to be a report of how you treat the patients? Even the vaccines were focused on well people. Remember, if you're well, you should take a vaccine. If you're well, you should, you should stay uh, locked down. The entire focus was on people well as opposed to people sick. Every single pandemic response measure. Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, if you're going to get behind a doctor's group, we had a COVID home treatment guide out in uh, October of 2020. If this would have been the U.S. pandemic response, we would have saved probably over a million American lives. Worldwide, we would have sent, saved tens of millions of lives, and we would have spared worldwide hundreds of millions of hospitalizations. But we needed to treat patients early. By, by December of 2020, Gukliakalas uh, here in Texas concluded that we had clear and convincing evidence that early treatment was working. We didn't have time for large randomized trials or drug companies to come in and save us. Remember, it was two years before Paxlovid came on the market. We had two years where we didn't have a single oral drug at home. Now we're faced with long COVID and post-vaccine injury syndromes. People feel sick over time because the spike protein is in their body for a very prolonged period of time. This paper from Germany shows that about 70% of people with long COVID is really because they took the vaccines, and the vaccines load the body with spike protein. And Perry and colleagues from Australia have shown it is the spike protein in the body that makes people feel sick, causes headaches, uh, loss of, of taste and smell, weakness, uh, the inability to exercise, sleep disturbance. Every, every autopsy and biopsy that's done, the spike protein is everywhere. In these blood clots, the spike protein is physically in the blood clot. It actually causes blood clots. And both COVID infection installs the spike protein and the vaccines install a ton of it in the human body. And in my practice, we look for this and we find this every day. No wonder people feel bad. Now, if you had a great immune system, and you took early treatment, you probably could fight off the virus enough, especially if you use nasal sprays, and get very little spike protein in the system. So people who did the best probably were on nasal sprays right away. But I bet the vast majority of you didn't even know about a nasal spray when you got COVID. No one told you. No one told me. I didn't know either. I got COVID in October of 2020. In that video, you saw my face was fat. I had COVID. I had trouble breathing. It was in my lungs. I was taking steroids. My face was fat. I was outside because I was trying to breathe. I didn't know about it either. I'm actually disappointed. I didn't know how useful nasal sprays and gargles are, but I know now. Brogna and colleagues from Germany has shown the spike protein is in half the subject to take the vaccine in the bloodstream, even out to six months. No wonder people feel sick after the vaccine. Six months later, this spike protein, which is relatively indestructible, is not being cleared from the body. There's recent evidence to suggest that the messenger RNA probably does clear out of the body slowly, though it does break down with enzymes, but the spike protein needs assistance to get out of the body. We've recently published this paper, two peer-reviewed papers from Dallas, showing that we can use some natural substances to help, and they include natokinase, 2,000 units twice a day, bromelain, 500 milligrams a day, and curcumin. So um, the SDA church is really ahead of most all other organized uh, religions in the United States on various forms of natural products to handle things. This is a winner. The prescription drugs don't handle this. Natokinase is derived from the breakdown of soy. It's a natural product available in a capsule. You can eat natto. I've done it. It's actually not bad in my view. Bromelain is derived from the stems of pineapples, and curcumin is derived from turmeric. These are low doses, and they can be increased. But we have over a year and a half of experience now, people sick after the vaccines or with long COVID, and they get better. It's slow, 
where they get better. Now, it's a base that we add other drugs to, but anybody here who has family members struggling after the vaccine or with COVID, this is reasonably safe. Now, it is slightly anticoagulant, so a complication could be bleeding, so we have to keep a watch for that, and that it should be taken on an empty stomach. So if you take it with the food stream, the, the enzymes get preoccupied with the food stream. But the, the data show that these natural enzymes do get in the system and they break down the spike protein. Very good preclinical de data to show that. Almost everybody here has been through COVID. Who's actually had COVID here? Everybody? Okay, just about a couple of people haven't. If you've already had COVID, this is the best paper to quote. This is from a U.S. prison system, New England Journal of Medicine, October 2022. 59,000 prisoners, 16,000 staff. Once a person has had the Delta or Omicron variant, 0% chance of hospitalization and death. So when you get called when your, your uh, grandmother or your aunt and uncle has COVID, just ask them, did you have it before? If it's a second case, it's going to be mild. You'll get them through it. They won't be hospitalized. The prisoners in this study are very motivated to get out of prison and go to the hospital for a few days. And believe me, none of them got sick enough to do that. So here's the new risk stratification paradigm. If there's been well-documented prior COVID, the next case has negligible risk, and there are risk factors. But do you know that through this entire time, you know, I'm a graduate of Southwestern Medical School. I was top person in my class. In fact, Southwesterns had me back and said, well, I'm one of the top 30 graduates they've ever had at the institution. They had a big interview with, with me and what have you. And I, and I really hit them on this. I said, where were you guys during the pandemic? How come you didn't have public education forums? How come you didn't have open clinics to help people through? Where were you when the community needed you the most? The medical schools in the United States were absent. The hospitals were absent. They didn't present any information. There should have been monthly updates. It should have been happening. You know, the church is closed down. Church is a great opportunity to get educated. Do your own research. Nobody, this is a brand new pandemic. We're now four years into it, and finally we're starting to get some, you know, independent information on this. This should have been on TV screens. People need to be educated. In fact, we've been told only one thing the entire time is get a vaccine. That's been the only message. Now we're faced with the avian influenza outbreak. You heard about a man in Texas uh, who got it. He's simply a case of pink eye. Uh, two days ago, Sid Miller, our ag director, ordered basically the culling or the slaughter of uh, several million chickens. Okay. And um, this is taking off. There's gain-of-function research being done on this. This is well documented. This is our substack. This is free if you want to go read Courageous Discourse. Gain of function research, just like it was done with COVID, is being done on avian flu. We're keeping a real careful watch on this because if this starts, you start to hear, see more human cases or human to human transfer, I can tell you it's been genetically engineered. Something is going on very bad in these biological laboratories. Now there's a scare. Is it safe to drink milk or eat chicken? The, the WHO is calling, you know, urgent move to have global power o over pandemic response. Pay attention to these things. They're going to affect your life. COVID affected your life. I know I was caught by surprise. I'm not going to be caught by surprise this time. There's no way. Different topic, and this is a disturbing one. Remember I talked about vaccine ideology, that vaccines are imperfect but we all have to take them. That's kind of the thought. You know, in 1986, uh, there was legislation. Another time, George W. Bush, HHS, and, um, and uh, uh, the, the House, Congress. It was called the Vaccine uh, Compensation Act. And in 1986, said vaccines have unavoidable harms because once they're injected, you can't get them out of the body. And because they have unavoidable harms, the vaccine companies have to be indemnified. They can have no liability if someone's injured by a vaccine. That was 1986. And at that time, the number of vaccines used in the United States skyrocketed as more, more technology came out. I'm not going to have time to go into it tonight, but in the upper left-hand corner, look how the number of vaccines have grown that children receive. So when I was a kid, there was about three shots, 1960. 
Look at now, a child today is going to receive 108 shots, sometimes 13 at one time. There is a clear connection now with this excessive childhood vaccination and the development of autism, attention deficit disorder, seizures, allergic disorders. And there's a clear connection between autistic kids and gender dysphoria. A, a child wanting to change their gender. The research is really clear. You know, you know, five or ten years ago, gender change surgery was nothing. We didn't talk about this in Grand Rounds. I was in Grand Rounds. I lectured at medical schools. Do you know right now that every single ma major medical society, American College of Pediatrics, American College of Sexual Gynecology, American Co College of Family Medicine, say the correct thing to do is if a child is having problems, let's say at age 10, the correct thing to do is to, is to actually consider changing their gender if there's some confusion. This isn't COVID. This is now a new, dramatically different way of thinking. The gender, hormones, and medicines make the kids sick because they're not supposed to be having those. The surgeries are disfiguring sterilizing cause tremendous complications. We can't undo this. And every study so far shows that transgender medicine increases the risk of homicide, suicide, and death from other causes. It's so bad to do this that the state attorney general's office had to basically stop it. UT Southwestern was doing it. Baylor in Houston, Texas Children's. This is a horror show. This is a nightmare. What ethical doctor would do this? What ethical nurse would be in one of these clinics? Something is going on in the minds of people. And you know right now Putin in Russia is trying to put down a transgender uprising, and I went to India and I saw it in India, and the same thing is in Indonesia, in Europe. It's the same, something has infected the minds of people. They're not thinking correctly. It's so awful that Ken Paxton had to basically file to ban this in Texas. It was overturned by the ACLU, so it was game on again for transgender surgery. And I got a call one day from Paxton's office. They said, Dr. McCullough, we can't find a single prominent doctor to go against this transgender narrative. I said, you found one now. I dropped everything, I wrote a report, it went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court, and it's banned as of September 5th, 2023. Since when do we have to ban things like this because doctors and nurses can't ethically check themselves? This is prima facie evidence that we are in a great controversy. We're in some time now. This is not just fear-driven. People aren't thinking correctly. This is, when I was a kid, autism was 1 in 10,000. It's now 1 in 36. It is a pediatric emergency going on in society of what's causing autism. Nobody really knows. But boy, you think there'd be some investigation into whether or not it's related to hypervaccination. It's so bad, the World Council for Health now says parents are urged to stop and wait. Just put a, put a hold on these vaccines. We don't have threats of diphtheria or pertussis. We can treat that with a Z-pack. Come on, we don't need all these shots. Five studies show kids that go natural and who take no vaccines, they're far healthier than kids who take all these vaccines. Five studies show that. And that's the reason why the World Council for Health says to defer on the vaccines. One of the reasons why we're here is because there's censorship all over. You can't get this lecture at Grand Rounds at Southwestern or Baylor. You can't go on TV and see this. But you can't censor the live interaction. Thank God for SDA because you have like a curriculum on your holy day to actually have a segment like this, right? Thank God that the SDA is, of course, about worship and thanks and praise to God, but the SDA is also about respecting God's creation, your body that God gave you. And the only way to do that is to learn. This virus came out of a Chinese biosecurity lab. No one could have known what to do, myself included. This has been a learning experience. 
No one knew if the vaccines were safe or not. There was great fear. I don't, I don't, I don't blame anybody for taking a vaccine. Recently, I went on Daystar for the fifth time. Daystar is the largest Christian broadcasting network in the world. And the show was seen by 2.7 billion people. B with the B. And Joni Lamb said something very important. She said it multiple times. God is bigger than a vaccine. It's true. Our medical freedom is related to our social and economic freedoms. Once our medical freedom was taken away, the entire thing crumbles, just like it did in the smallpox vaccination and with the COVID vaccination. In the churches, there was a crisis of coercion. And do you know the COVID states program, which is Biden and HHS, they had a program called Faith for Vaccines. Faith for Vaccines. It was a massive bribe of every church leader in the world to push the vaccines. A bribe, a massive one. Do you know there's a Vatican coin, a 20 euro coin that was minted? And it shows a boy, and he's about to receive the Eucharist, but he's not. He's receiving the vaccine. What would be in the mind of those in the Vatican to equate a genetic vaccine with the blood and body of Christ? You can't make this up. You can't make this up. I think we're seeing the hand of Satan at work here. I'm telling you as a doctor, I'm a scientist, but there's no other explanation for what we're seeing. So to finish and conclude, this pandemic has been a disaster. The safety profile of these vaccines is known. Limitations of efficacy have evolved over time. The vaccines were never safe. They never worked. We have this rise now of, of excessive vaccination, autism, transgenderism. We need to find a way to unwind all this. Censorship and reprisal are working to curb freedom of speech. You know, I've testified three times in the U.S. Senate, and by invitation, way ahead of time, Fauci is supposed to be there, uh, Walensky, Ja, Redfield, the entire COVID response is supposed to be there, Vice President is supposed to be there. No one will face me. No one. There's not a single chief of medicine in any medical school who will face me. In 2019, I was the endowed named visiting professor at Harvard. I lectured in multiple divisions. You read my Wikipedia page. It was scintillating with my contributions to medicine. Now you read it, and I've, I've been uh, uh, discredited. I've been knocked down. I've been marked, scarred. I'm the same person. I'm the same person. The question is, what happened to everybody else? Ask your doctor that. This is your charge. What happened? What happened, doctor? Doctor, are you still taking these vaccines? You told me to take one a year ago or two years ago. Have you had your ninth shot, doctor? Why have you given up on them? You have to change the dialogue here. You have to. I can't do it. I've said what I've said. I'm telling you right now, more people will die and be maimed and injured as these vaccines roll out. You have a moral and ethical obligation that you, now that you know this, to warn others. You cannot be silent. You have an ethical and moral and spiritual obligation to your own body if you took one of these vaccines to do a check. Are you okay? You have that obligation. Listen, mankind thrust this upon us. What I've presented today, I think, largely has been the hand of Satan. The virus was almost the perfect instrument of Satan. It shut down houses of worship, well, kept the liquor stores and the strip joints open. It, 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 it took away people's freedoms. It caused our, our loved elderly to die alone in complete and total desperation. If that isn't the hand of Satan, I don't know what it is. And now the vaccines were quickly advanced and then forced on people, and particularly forced on young people. Within a year, you never heard about senior citizens taking vaccines. You heard about college kids having being forced on them, and then to have now record numbers of cardiac arrests and deaths. Distortion of the human body, blood clots, heart damage. My clinic that I see this every day is like a war zone, as if I'm seeing the hand of Satan. 
So let us all learn from this. It can happen. It can happen on our watch, and it did. But now's the time to take steps, and we can all take steps. So we've weighed out the evidence today, like this angel weighing out the evidence. The fate of our country, I think, is in the is, 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 is lies in the balance, and we have to roar like a lion. St. Augustine said, the truth is like a lion. What I presented to you today, every single citation is a fact. What I presented today is the truth. The truth is like a lion. You let the truth out, it can defend itself. Don't worry about your position on things. There are, there's enough goodness out there. You can rely on the societies that I've quoted. You can rely on me. I went on Joe Rogan's podcast. I said every record he ever had. I've also been on a podcast for a little 10-year-old boy from Germany who had 10 little boys, you know, five to 10 boys who listened to him on his podcast. I told Tucker Carlson, if I helped one person, it was worth it. One. Now you go out and you go help other people and together we can get ourselves out of this great controversy. I'm Dr. Peter McCullough. Thank you so much for having me. And here's the book. You can find it anywhere. Amazon, courage to face uh, It was the only book in the last four years that Amazon banned on their platform by, for about 12 days for no reason. They said, they said offensive content. We said, where is it? I don't even cuss or drink alcohol. Why did they try to ban this? Because it's the truth. It lays out what happened early on. It's not even about the vaccines. It's about people being denied treatment, being denied their rights. And it, most of it took place in Dallas. So pick up a copy. And again, thanks so much for having me. Am I going to take questions? or? Sure. Do you have time? I have time. Yeah. Okay, great. Just raise your hand and make sure that the question is concise. And, and, and you get to decide. Whoever asks the best questions, they get a signed copy of the book. Okay, you sure. decide. <laughs> no problem. No so, pressure. Well, hold no on a pressure. second. These are the ground rules. Make yes. sure that the questions are concise and they're relevant to the presentation. And uh, just keep them to a minimum, okay? Uh, don't try to do two questions through one question, okay? <laughs> so uh, let's start right here. They'll go there. Then I'll go to Pastor Ross. So I just want to thank you for all the work you've done. God bless you. And um, so... Um, I'm pretty well read and educated about stuff going on with COVID. And um, so I, you know, I know after Biden got in, you know, Trump, to his credit, didn't push for mandates. But when Biden got in, he pushed for our military to get mandated uh, to get vaccinated um, th with this experimental product, which I see as a security risk. You know, if long term mm -hmm. turns out it turns out bad. But I haven't seen anything in the media anywhere where like people that are coming into our country illegally, and we don't know how many millions now, but they're, tell me if I'm wrong, I have not seen any massive impetus from the federal government to mass vaccinate, to insist that they be mass vaccinated with this, you know, with this safe and effective product, you know, and so what is the agenda there, <laughs> you know? Well, it's a great point. So if the vaccines are so safe and effective, and we have so many new people coming to the country as migrants, why wouldn't be vaccination be on the list of concerns for them? You're right. So we've had two presidential administrations. Um, the the, the uh, Biden military mandates have been overturned. In fact, overturned because my testimony went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. So you're looking at them, right? And about a third of the military got COVID before the vaccines even came out. And they were low risk. And then our soldiers were being damaged with myocarditis and blood clots. There were countless numbers of cases. So the vaccines physically injured our military, but it did something more than that. Is for the first time, they were demoralized. The vast majority of soldiers did not want to take the shots. They had something forced in their body against their will. And I think that's really been critical. We had about 10,000 military, I think out of uh, 2 million people in DOD, we got up at 10,000 said, I'm not taking it, 10,000. And every single one of them had a fight. Some people were kicked out, but other people weren't. And it's interesting why some people were and some people weren't. But there are some strong leaders in our military, and I give them great credit for standing up. If I was in the military, in fact, I, uh, unfortunately, I was asked to consult on a boy 
at uh, the Naval Academy, and I know the Naval Academy well because my son had gotten accepted there, and the poor, the poor boy was in the dorms, and his mother was on the, on the Webex, and she was bawling that he took one shot of Moderna, and his heart was nearly destroyed with one shot of Moderna. And uh, he said, Dr. McCullough, they're telling me that if I don't take the second shot, they're going to throw me out of the Naval Academy. I said, I think it's going to take your life. And I said, why don't you walk down the hall? I was literally in that same building. You go walk down that hall, and you tell your commanding officer you're not taking the shot. And if he doesn't like it, you tell him you bring his officer. And if he doesn't like it, you bring him. Why don't you bring Lloyd Austin? He said, well, Dr. McCullough, you don't know about chain of command. I said, you don't know about courage. You don't know about who has guts and who doesn't. That's what we're talking about here. If we had people with guts, we wouldn't be in this mess. Really? This boy is going to have his life taken because the military says he has to take a second shot? No way. No way. This is about being strong and fighting. And we, we saw that there was very, you saw pockets of strength. I didn't take one of these shots. I told when I was at Baylor, I told him, listen, I'm not taking a shot. I said, anybody wants me to take it? I already had COVID. I said, somebody wants me to take a shot. I want him in my office. I want to see him right in front of me. Oh, no, you don't have to take a shot, Dr. McCullough. This was a big game. I told Joe Rogan, this was a big game of chicken. Who's got guts and who doesn't? Let's have a next question. That's a good one, though. Do you have a protocol to help those that have taken the shot and are repenting of that and trying to rectify the situation? Right. So the protocol is the uh, base spike detoxification. That's McCullough Protocol. We've published that. And it's not the only one out there, but I think it has the best chance of helping people survive this. And, and the vast majority of people should be taking um, natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. I'm personally doing it myself because I got the third episode of COVID and my ears are ringing off and I need my ears to stethoscope. Most of us should be on this. Uh, right now, a, a, a doctor who's very prominent in, in this whole medical freedom space, Dr. Richard Urso in Houston, um, is, uh, he's reported last night that he's my age or younger. He's just had a stroke, a major one. He's in the ICU in Houston. We are seeing blood clots in people, whether they've taken the shots or not, because COVID has been everywhere. The CDC has wastewater data, and you, when you measure the virus, it's in all the sewer pipes everywhere. So I'm telling you, it's everywhere, and all of us are more prone to blood clotting than we've ever been before. So this is a natural way, in addition to aspirin, to be a little bit on the blood thin side. I mean, we should just, I think, and we can do this with conventional blood thinners like Eliquis. Yes? Well, who's next? Who's got the mic? Oh, Roger. way back there. There you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Doctor, yeah. and uh, thank you for your time and your stand for truth and your courage. Um, just had a quick question. Apologize. Um, about uh, the, the COVID uh, vaccine or the co our, our mRNA remnants in our food supply. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing stuff about this. I've been hearing about Bill Gates buying up farmland in America and the government paying farmers not to farm, not mm -hmm. to, you know, so that the food chain is, is um, kind of stocked by the government or stoked by the government to, uh, to do their thing instead of what the, what the farmers want to do. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? The genetic vaccines are very attractive to the companies because they can be made quickly, inexpensively, and they can be adapted to new organisms. The United States invested since 1985 tens of billions of dollars in messenger RNA. There's 9,000 patents on messenger RNA. I've never seen such a surge of, of, of biotech interest that I've seen in messenger RNA. It's, it's just unbelievable. This is the current status of things. Genetic vaccines are in pigs right now since 2017. Self-replicating RNA and DNA in pigs. Now the hope is with the curing and cooking process of pork that we're okay. The genetic vaccines are not in vegetables yet. They're not in fish. Chicken has been genetically vaccinated 
in most countries around the world with a whole variety of vaccines except in the United States and Canada, thank goodness. Some chicken in Mexico has got genetically vaccinated. Again, we're hoping with the current cooking and, and, and process that that hopefully is denatured. Be wary of this. Two states, Kentucky and Missouri, have already passed legislation that if, if genetic vaccines are going to be used, we want to know, they want to put it on the label. There has been a strong fight from lobbyist groups and largely the Democratic Party to have no labeling so we're not warned on what we're eating. Okay, so the best advice right now is go organic. We're hoping that farmers will, will step up and actually tell us if they're not using, the genetic vaccines are not needed, the conventional vaccines are fine. There are holistic veterinarians that say with modern farming technique, no vaccines are needed. They're simply not needed. They're, they're, they're extra. This vaccine ideology, remember I said where people kind of lost their minds in vaccines? It applies in veterinary medicine. Do you know dogs and cats are getting progressively more and more vaccines every year? Probably some of you know this. It's the same thing. People have lost their minds on vaccines. That's where we are in the food supply. Um, one of the things about this avian flu, it looks like uh, what screwed this up is in Europe, they were vaccinating chickens over there and they decided to va vaccinate ducks and some of the ducks then uh, spread around uh, a mutant strain because, because once you vaccinate, the virus will, will mutate and potentially become more contagious. So we have that coming out on our Substack tomorrow. We broke the news. I started McCullough Foundation here in Dallas and Nick Hulsher is our first fellow from University of Michigan. We're going to break a lot of news stories because our government is not telling us what's going on. Okay, who's next? But no, no genetic vaccines in, in uh, fruits and vegetables. I know, I know the SDA is largely vegetarian, so I think you're, you're fine. Yes. So I hope everyone heard her observation. It's, it's, it's in theme of what we've gone over the last hour. Ivermectin is a drug that's an anti-parasitic that is safe and effective for river blindness and scabies. And it, you know, it, it, it was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015. It's safer than Tylenol. There's 102 studies that are supportive of its use in COVID-19. I personally think at high doses, it's the best thing we have. We get people better in a couple of days. I mean, it's really got a pop to it. Ivermectin should be flowing. There are 20 countries in the world that just give it out. They give it out in packets. So if they give it out in Honduras, why would they not give it to you in Texas if a doctor prescribes it? No one can explain what's going on. This is so... Um, aberrant that the FDA put all these misleading statements out there. You can't use ivermectin. It doesn't work. It's just for horses. And then it went to a court case. Dr. Bowden, thank God, Dr. Bowden in Houston led it with Dr. Apter and Merrick. They sued the FDA. They paid their own money to pay for their attorneys to sue the FDA and said, you're deceiving America on this. And then finally, in a settlement, the FDA two days ago just took down all their false information on ivermectin. Why would the FDA deceive us on a safe, available, affordable drug when 20 other countries make it fully available. Practically what you need to know is we can prescribe it in Texas. 
but we use specific compounding pharmacies. CVS and Walgreens won't do it. You have to find a doctor who will work with a compounding pharmacy. So in my practice, this Dr. Proctor and all the nurse practitioners, Yvette Lozano does it here. Several doctors uh, here in the crowd today will do it, but we need to use co uh, community pharmacies. We end up using Las Colinas Pharmacy or Beakers or others. So there's almost like a black market for ivermectin. It's safer than Tylenol. I am telling you, every single person in America hospitalized with COVID should have gotten ivermectin. It's easy, just take it. Yet hospitals specifically denied ivermectin, specifically. And, and family members, there was a family in Buffalo, New York, and one in Chicago, they went to court and said, please give my grandmother ivermectin. And then the court said, give them ivermectin. The hospital said, we're not going to do it. So an outside doctor came in and gave ivermectin and revived them, and they went home. So the intent is to reduce the population. I don't know what the motivation is, but these collective observations, you just brought one to the, to the floor. Thank you. None of them make sense outside of they seem to be a manifestation of evil. Amen. Evil in the minds of people from the pharmacist and others, fear, the doctor who's afraid. So fear and evil are themes. Yes, yes, doctor. Yeah, so the, the animal ivermectin is a different formulation, but if one got the same dose, it's essentially the same stuff. So in desperation, people did it. Yes, doctor. Permit me to stand. Um, I am so happy to meet Dr. Martolo. I'm Dr. E.B. Ukebu. I'm an internist. And I heard about him and about another physician, those who are fighting this. And this um, topic is so appropriately titled about courage. I had just purchased my house, we just moved, and if I dared to go against the narrative, I was going to be denied my hospital privileges, probably lose my license. And I said, I'm ready to do that. I will not take the vaccine, and I will treat my patients with ivermectin. Today, I've treated over a thousand patients. Mm -hmm. My office is in DeSoto. You can use private pharmacies. They will give you ivermectin. Mm -hmm. And I really applaud Dr. McCullough for the fight because what they did was to challenge us. More is coming. And if you don't have the courage, you will not stand. This was their test run. My husband followed COVID from December 2019. And he said, I'm following this virus in China and I don't know what's going on. They broke every rule of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. because they, it was to get people to die and to be fearful. And then they will come with their mandate. And at that point, you will succumb. I, before they even bad-mouthed uh, ivermectin, I recommended it for my patient in the hospital that was about to be ventilated the next day. He, he recovered and walked out alive. Mm -hmm. They did not want that. And that was that why they shut everything down. Thank you, Dr. McCullough, for the Thank courage. You. But I'm telling you, everybody, be ready. Just like the Christians were warned about the destruction of Jerusalem, the first warning, this is the first warning. There's more to come. God bless you. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to cap it at how many of you have a question? One, two? These are such and good questions, though. I really okay. Right. I'm really, uh, but really. Honored. We have a baptism that we, we have to we do as well. We cannot let the baby wait. So, yes. uh, okay, so let us just move quickly. It could be a baby, maybe it's somebody else. Yeah, my name is Marcel, and then um, I was working in a facility where it was mandatory to take the vaccine. And then uh, I went point blank to the, uh, to the manager. I said, it's either my uh, life, I don't take the vaccine, or I'm out of here. And then, uh, but when I was saying that, I was relying, I was having in my mind that the, 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 the church, my church would give me a letter for exemption, you know? But when I've heard that the, the general conference um, asked the churches not to provide any letter, I'm like, wait a minute, so what I'm gonna do? 
So uh, finally, I was relying on the Southeastern of, of the um, General Conference. But when I've heard that, I said, oh, I prefer my life, I'd rather uh, I'll quit my job. So that's the reason why I quit my job, because this, the conference, the General Conference, didn't want the churches to provide any letters. Well, you know, most, most religions, it would be cohesive with their ethical and religious directives to not take something in your body knowing that it can harm God's creation. I mean, that cuts across Christianity, Islam, uh, virtually every religion in the world. If you have a truly firmly held belief, you know, people fill out their own religious uh, exemption. But you're right, people were denied. There are hundreds and hundreds of course cases where uh, religious uh, ob objections were uh, were simply ignored. Now we learn that they're contaminated with SV40, and this comes from the E. coli process. How the, um, how the uh, DNA actually comes into the process is using, you know, immortal fetal cell lines. So that's actually in the process. So one, let's say Catholics, where they have, you know, 60 ethical and religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, directives. They can say, listen, uh, aborted fetal tissue actually was used during the process of it. It's, it's not physically in the vials. But this whole idea, I filled out a religious exemption. I said, listen, it's, it's against my religion to take something in my body that I know is going to do harm. Just like doing cocaine or something else. It's like, I'm not doing it. And we saw for the first time people's religious freedom being denied. I wanted to share a nurse practitioner who lost her job in Austin because she refused to take the vaccine and we wrote a letter and she did regain it five months later. Her husband was an Austin police officer and when they tried to get the Austin police force to all take the vaccine, they said, we will walk. Are you <laughs> sure you want to do that? And so they decided actually maybe they did not have to take the vaccine. <laughs> so standing up is worth it. Yeah, standing up. I have a funny anecdote. Thank you for that one. Is I met a nurse one time in, uh, in, um, in uh, Kansas. And she was older. She said, Dr. McCullough, should I work on a, on a um, nursing service? And I, I didn't want to take the vaccines. They're not safe. And they told me, if I don't take it, I'm going to lose my job. And I, I didn't. They, they called me in. They said, you're fired. You are gone. She, she's older. She said, okay, well, you know, I'm gone. And then two days later, they called her back and they said, can you cover the night shift? <laughs> so wait a minute. So, so much of this was just, there was no law anywhere that said you had to follow one of these mandates. There were none of these laws. There were no laws for any of these things. You know, in Canada, it was one of the worst places to be. And they had a rule that if you cross the Canadian border, that you'd have to stay in a quarantine for 14 days. You know that people stayed in these hotels? But you know, I know some people that would, would drive across and they'd say, see, I'm out of here, and they would just take off. They're not going to a hotel. There was no laws. This was a test of could you do things, could people tell you to do things where there's no, no against, there was no laws to support that, and to see if people would do it. And who would stand up and who didn't? So that's a, that's, that, you know, that's a great example. But sadly, in France, there's about 2,000 doctors who still cannot practice because they're not taking the vaccine. We've got about 1,000 in Australia. Um, you, you know, there's, I'm not taking the vaccine. I've certainly suffered plenty of professional damage. Virtually every doctor and nurse that did not take a vaccine, you know, was damaged by this. And by the way, there was no transmission in the healthcare facility. It's not like a doctor ever gave it to a patient. There was never any transmission, a well-described transmission of a student to a teacher, for instance. All of that was unnecessary. Um, yes, my question is, um, can you be my doctor? Sure, yeah. <laughs> and I'm busy, I have a lot of, pay. I'm up in, I'm in McKinney at El Dorado and Alma, but I'll do the best I can. Yes, thank so. you, doctor. My office used to be just two miles at Baylor for years used to be much easier. Okay, is that it? Uh, let me crisscross here real quick. You're going to crisscross and, and then you're going to have to decide who had the best question or comment. So, thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. McCullough. Yes. Um, just kind of in full disclosure, I'm also a physician. Uh, my name is Elder Baez. I'm a nephrologist down in the Mansfield area. Uh, thank you so much for being mm -hmm. here. You know, I had one technical question, um, which was uh, with these uh, sudden death cases, right, where we have cardiac mm -hmm. arrest, et cetera, uh, is there a heavy evidence of like spike protein in the tissue or some, some kind mm -hmm. of direct link um, between what's happened clinically and then what we suspect is the cause? And maybe more importantly, I had a broader question um, about how you learn. So. One of the things that really took me aback was when our medical journals, major medical journals, appeared to be completely captured. Uh, many here may not know, but for example, the New England Journal of Medicine published uh, a strong editorial making a political recommendation that was, you know, unprecedented. Yeah. It made it kind of uh, totally, de you know, remove my faith in any further information that <laughs> that's published there. And you know, those are all of our leading papers. So, how do you learn about these things? Yeah, I'm the most published person in my field in the world in history. So you can imagine, I was the editor of two major journals. I never did a paper, ever, ever, because I, I ran a good operation. We had vetting. Now we're seeing papers published that are just retracted, valid papers that are contracted, published, cited in the National Library of Medicine. We're seeing wide open fraud and corruption. Why would the New England Journal of Medicine comment on presidential politics? Something is really, really gone astray. So um, I, I, we just cannot be stopped. We, I started an independent journal with Dr. Jack Lyons-Weiler from University of Pittsburgh. It's called Science, Public Health Policy, and the Law. Uh, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons has their own journal. We're just going to honestly publish in our own journals. I, I love publishing in New England Journal of Medicine. I've published tons of papers there. In fact, one of my first COVID patients, uh, papers was in Lancet. It doesn't matter. I'm bringing the truth and I'm going to make my fair observations. In the paper by Holscher and colleagues, of people who are dying, when they get fair autopsies and they look for it, there's spike protein in the heart and it's causing this inflammation and arrhythmias. People having these cardiac arrests are having it because of the vaccine. Now, the, 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 the patches may be so small that we can't see it on the autopsy slices or we can't see it on, on MRI. It's just too small. But that's the leading thought. When a young person who's previously healthy, suddenly has a cardiac arrest. It is the vaccine until proven otherwise. Now, if the family comes out and said they didn't take the vaccine, we can rule it out. You remember when DeMar Hamlin for the Buffalo Bills went down, and they called me on the news 24 hours later. I was on vacation, actually, and they called me on the news. Tucker Carlson wanted me on. And I said, listen, that's the vaccine until proven otherwise. That was a full-blown cardiac arrest. And they kept asking him, and he wouldn't say whether they took the vaccine. And in the end, he said, well, it's because he tackled somebody hard. They tackle hard all day long in the NFL. That was a vaccine cardiac arrest. Why would the NFL want to cover this up? Why wouldn't they want to warn others? I, I've, I've had meetings now with the major sports teams. There's all kinds of legal cases. Nobody wants to come clean on this. Why? We shouldn't be embarrassed about this. This isn't the first bad set of medical or vaccine products out there. Why can't we just fairly say that these ones didn't work and they weren't safe? People are having a hard time admitting the truth. Hi, Dr. McCullough. I, so I've been following your story for a little while and I just really appreciate what um, God has blessed you to do. And there's a... a, a a verse in the Bible that says all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. I want you just to talk to us a little bit about how this experience has grown your faith, please. Well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, before the pandemic, I would characterize myself as a kind of a leading edge doctor, very confident in myself. I had traveled the world lectured at the European Medical Association, New York Academy of Sciences, FDA, you know, was revered all over the world. But I didn't really believe that Satan was out there working on the side of evil, and I really didn't believe that God specifically had a plan for me. I do believe those two things now. There's... It's no mistake 
that you're here right now listening to this words, that you decided today to come. It's no mistake that we're connecting. I have a sense that God is working very actively right now. And like all great calamities, there was a small number of people, thankfully, who were chosen to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And sadly, a large group of people who have scales over their eyes. They really can't see this. And it's even more disturbing to see this occur in family members. You probably can look at your family and see that your family is kind of divided. You know when someone has scales on their eyes, when you bring up these topics, they'll say, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. There's something going on right now, and, and, and in many ways, it's very exciting but terrifying to be alive. I like the comments about, listen, this may, this may not be the end. It looks like there's more to come. We will face a financial crisis that will be absolutely crushing in our country. The spending pattern cannot go on. It will, you will see, it will happen, it has to. There, it's impossible for, this series of infectious disease threats, this, this distortion of, of gender that's going on. Do you know 20% of high school seniors now are LGBT, 20%? Wow. This is going to have a ripple effect through society, and it's all over the world. It's in India, and in Russia, and in Indonesia, and in Europe. None of these things are uniquely American. Because it's so simultaneous and it's so worldwide, I think it has to be a great time of spiritual turmoil right now. There's no other explanation. Thank you so much for the comment. Okay, so... Uh, oh, I guess everybody's phone's going off. Hold on one sec. Can you imagine? Everybody has to turn off their phones for the Amber Alert. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to decide. You're, That's very difficult. Decide. But let me, let me tell you, 